Thank you for joining us once again. This is Julio Cotto here at the National Hispanic Institute Home Office in Maxwell. I'm joined by our president and founder, Ernesto Nieto. And this afternoon, we're going to spend a, just a few brief moments discussing some of the topics for the 2018 great debates that are coming up. We're expecting our largest great debate class in history, especially here in the state of Texas. Um, Ernesto, oratory is, I know for you, one of your favorite topics of the four in the great debate experience, we're working with freshmen, working on really developing and advancing their communication capacities, skills, and knowledge. And oratory is a unique event because uh, it's an individual experience. A student has to craft a, a speech, but I think that the oratory game uh, asks students to be very creative, reflective, and then they have to imagine possibilities. This year's theme revolves around social labels and policy what, to you, what, what was the importance uh, or, or how does oratory play a role in developing uh, our, our communication skills or our co future communicators? I feel like I need to respond to the constant question of my granddaughter, Isabella Sada, who is an oratory coach with the Austin team. And uh, uh, there, there can be easily, this topic, uh, this topic can be easily confused because of the emphasis we placed on combative, competitive kinds of uh, 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 communications programs like cross-examination and uh, mock trial, which are very competitive and, and it's point-counterpoint oriented. When you look at oratory in the great debate, we're really exploring the child's mind or the student's mind to be creative and to be spontaneous and to be imaginative and inventive. And so the question before the participant or the student participating in oratory is first develop a firm grasp of what the theme is this year. This theme this year is very importantly directed at social labels and the impact, both negative and positive, on entire populations and societies. We covered the entire thing called minority or third world countries or backwards countries and how we freely use in the marketplace identifiers that add or, or delete value from people and their standing and their status uh, without thinking at times or maybe by intention. And we want our young people to be more conscious of how social labels are applied to them as individuals as they make the transition to college, as they transition into society as they begin to take on leadership roles, things of that nature, labels, they'll be called progressive, liberal, conservative, outrageous. Uh, it, it'll just go on and on. The more conscious they are of how labels affect sentiments, how labels affect, affect behaviors and perceptions, the better they'll, they'll be able to navigate the use of labels in a more effective way in the future. As leaders, people of influence, and people that want communities to think in particular ways. So you have an opportunity, and it's really interesting, and it says here uh, that as an, imag as an imaginative uh, uh, thinker, make something, uh, make an argument that injects, and we call it an asset-oriented label that uplifts and strengthens Latino identity in the future. Historically, we have been used to using the label minority or disadvantage or at risk, uh, labels of that nature. In this case, the student is being asked, if you were in the position to define the community as you want to, and as you think it's appropriate to be uplifting and to be to, to charge the community with enthusiasm and to create vision and courage and all those things, what would be a singular word that you would propose as a societal identifier for the future Latino community? Why would you select that word? Why strategically, where strategically you would place it and what manner would you use it and what do you envision to be the intended outcome? How does it affect people's perceptions behaviors, operating beliefs, things of that nature. So the participant or the contestant in this case shouldn't just propose a label, shouldn't just come up with a word. They need to think about why. And I think the way we framed it for them is that it's supposed to be uh, persuasive 
And I think in their heads, they should imagine that whatever they're presenting could be used as something that could be used to go viral as a message or as a compelling. And, and that's the kind of the backdrop that we painted for them. I wanted to back up into the earlier paragraph of the topic here because some of the references that we gave the students included uh, the the creation of the term Chicano. Right. And that, you know, definitely it, it gets studied a lot. And whether you learn it in American history or you your parents talk about it or your grandparents. Um, and it's a term that was created and it was a term that had both positive and negative impacts. And it's also now talked about still today. We use it as an example of a term that was injected. Historically, what what fueled that, that movement of we need to now call ourselves something else? Well, first of all, the Chicano movement was, was and, and, and among the Mexican and within the Mexican-American community, um, uh, was, was labeled Chicano, the use of the term Chicano, really referred to young people being activist-driven, people that cared for community, embraced the community, and were willing to take a public stance in various forms, in various forms of expression, and bring into to light the particular plight of the conditions that were affecting the Latino community. And historically, people may overlook that. Uh, people from Mexico who's, who see Chicano as a politically active uh, uh, ha having a politically active connotation or even older, more conservative people that see it as something bad, as something that's inappropriate or incorrect uh, from a social point of view and they prefer the term Mexicano or Mexican, uh, uh, Mexican-American, a hyphenated identity. But it really was born out of the minds of young people to signify a special group of people and by the way, I want to make sure people understand this historically. These were educated young people. They were not high school dropouts. The people that took up, or should I say, became, became engaged and voiced their concerns were young men and women that were doing very well in high school and were doing very well in college. Uh, they, these weren't just anybody that was out there raising cane. They were people that really believed, really studied the issues, and could point to conditions in the community that had to be articulated. Now, they did it loud and proud, and because we were not used to being confrontational as a culture, some of the older generations, more conservative people, took issue with that and at times denied them, but I think they knew in their heart that these kids were right. What, what, do, what do you recall as, and I think we still see some echoes of it in places like California, uh, that there was this rejection of the term Hispanic and that Chicano or other terms were in reaction to, well, at least the way I'd even hear it in college was, uh, oh, Hispanic, that's a government created term. You know, we don't use that term. Uh, what were some of the conflicts going on in, in these discussions about social labels decades ago? Well, I want to say something here that maybe I shouldn't. Uh, but you know me, I will say it anyway, and maybe I'll get an email or some person attacking me on what I'm about to say. But um, I'm not going to let a university that's predominantly, predominantly driven by a white mindset define my identity, right? I don't think that was so much the question or the problem. I think there were some people that legitimately thought that the use of the word Hispanic was to infer having Spanish roots and denying our indigenous roots. And, and I think that was one of the arguments for not using the word Hispanic. Other people use the word Hispanic because during the 80s, especially during the 80s, we saw the rise and emergence of other Latino populations, the Puerto Ricans, the Dominicans, and much larger numbers. Uh, people from Central America, people from South America were immigrating into the United States in huge numbers under the Reagan administration. And so there was a search for an identifiable means of encompassing all of these people. So the label was, 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 um, was designed. It was also designed to, to give a group identity for marketing purposes. I mean, it was the age of the Hispanic by Coors Beer. And, you know, uh, maybe they wanted Latinos no longer to drink Budweiser. But the point is, is that there was an intent 
to market to specific populations, consumer populations. And so there is a social strategy behind the use of labels. It's not simply an identifier. It's also to sell products, to sell services, to and attract the attention of particular populations. Yeah, and it's, when I heard these things, I, it was kind of new to me in college that there was such a reaction because for me, I think being of two different Latino backgrounds and then not being uh, of Mexican descent, right. a term like Chicano, I got it and I didn't have anything against it, but I didn't feel included by it. Right. And actually a term like Hispanic to me was like, oh, well, this is, this this is the term of everybody, but it's loaded. There's public policy history behind it. I think if I'm gathering anything from this exchange is whatever label a student is going to present, they definitely need to examine all of the different ways it could be interpreted or used, um, not just simply come up with a term and write a speech, but they really have to explore all the different ways it could be interpreted. You know what I find interesting about that, uh, before we get back into the oratory aspect of this, is the fact that we're not in control of the labels we want. They're imposed. Even the word Hispanic was not created by us in our communities. The word Latino comes out of the college mindset. That's where I first heard it. And now Latino X, you know, the genderless understanding of who we are and the constant, we are the subjects of somebody else's understanding of marketing and label, labeling. Chicano, to go, to go back to what the earlier discussion was about, was invented in the Latino community, in the barrio, right. and, and, and professed by, by barrio youth. And that was our creation, our invention. Uh, and, and so we were very proud of it, and we were very proud to wear the jackets and the hats that went along with it, and the flags of unity and all those things. So it was more Chicano became not only an identifier for Mexican-Americans, it became a unifier for people who resisted oppression in this country. Why this topic now? Because we're about to enter, and we're already entering an era where we have even more segmentation of markets. We are a, we are a society of segments, and segments are the way in which people of business and people in politics determine how to influence and shape and, and, and direct particular population groups. Uh, there, is, there is a particular market that Walmart uh, goes after. There's a particular market that particular department stores go after or grocery stores go after or life insurance programs go after and, and poli po uh, political parties go after. Uh, and the, the larger the society, the more complicated and the more, the more separated we are by, by market segments. And it is to the advantage of people that sell services or sell products, pharmaceuticals, and things of that, uh, entities of that nature, to know specifically and attempt to be aware of common behaviors, common perceptions, common attitudes, common needs, common aspirations that can be organized around particular consumer groups and therefore targeted for those purposes for, for response reasons. So you like, Houston is a great example of a store called Fiesta. Fiesta store started by a guy named Donald Bottom way back in the 1970s. And because of the term fiesta, it was associated with Mexican-Americans in Houston. As a result, he began to sell what I call ethnic food, and we've called, called it tamales and all those kind of things, that were particular to a particular class of, of, of Mexican-Americans. Not just Mexican-Americans, but a particular working class. And the way in which he kept those stores was not necessarily that organized. It looked like an open-air mercado. And it was very attractive, and he, by design, created that kind of social, cultural atmosphere to attract and keep customers. We're into that era in a much more specialized manner. And through media and social media, we're able to attract or reject or cause, or cause concern about certain population. This is a bad, bad example, but right now, politically, the whole idea of the M13 uh, as, as it was told recently. Or immigrants as animals in that whole debate. Exactly. Of, of, was that meant? Was it not? But so, so we can, you can use it to rouse, arouse particular, particular populations. There is an, there's a hateful intention to use labels to cause anger and separation and rejection of certain populations. So we are in that area, particularly because of social media, 
And so therefore we thought it is very important at this time, uh, at this point of our development as an organization and as a Latino community looking into the future, that we be very aware of how those terms are used and loosely used or strategically used. And the more awareness we can create for young people, example, and I'm going to say this out loud and maybe uh, uh, people will take issue with it. I reject the word minority. I believe that the use of the word major uh, minority has a very negative implication of my social status. And if I am a minority on a college campus, it infers that I belong to a particular population that's not only disadvantaged, but its social standing is not as equal as the majority population. And it positions me in a way in which my voice is either weakened or confused in some form or fashion to where I'm not a full member at the table. It's funny, as you speak, I'm, I'm thinking also about how this conversation uh, is going to take place this summer uh, in, in our southern neighbor friends in Panama and the Dominican Republic and uh, in the Dominican Republic and in Mexico, because I, I'm starting to think as an American <clears throat> how that social label is evolving right now or is being scrutinized or interpreted differently in the current climate, uh, in the current global economy, that it may not it may not just be it may not carry the same weight and meaning. So I think it just causes me to think how these labels you may create a label with one purpose and it takes on a different purpose or meaning at some point. Uh, at some point in our imagery and, and our identity, it may not be very popular anymore to be American. Uh, and, and, and because historically, we were the people that brought peace to the world. And as we continue to drift into conflicts like with North Korea or the Middle East, uh, we may strictly be seen label-wise as a warlike nation. I don't think that anybody wanted that. I know from my generations, we don't want that. But again, it's all about the labels. And, and I don't blame other people for labeling America in particular ways if we don't live up to our democratic roots and principles. And we deserve to be criticized and we deserve to be called to, to, to defend uh, our actions and our views and our attitudes. And, and it's important. And as the world gets more complicated, uh, we're going to see a lot more, I, I think, um, difficulties. We're going to see a lot more conflict. We're going to see a lot more um, uh, divide or division between nations. And uh, I don't know how to predict, but it's going to affect us, I know, in terms of prices at the gas pump, clothes, the clothes we wear. It's going to affect us in the food we eat and the water we drink and the kind of uh, things we're going to, we normally get used to, healthcare services, things of that nature. It's going to affect our lifestyles in the long run. As it relates to oratory, why is the oratory experience, that game, that event, so unique and so important? Given all the, the themes and challenges and complexities of the oncoming future, oratory as an event itself, what, it, what, are the, what should the students or parents hope to gain from that event? That well, that I, more, than the, more than the parents, I want the kids to know that that's the artist's form of communication is the artful use of words to convey an image, to convey a concept, to convey, to convey an idea. And the way in which you put words together artfully and creatively and, ins and inspirationally, you can, literally take, you can literally take a word like frog and make it one of the most delightful words and give it a definition and give it a symbol and give it to where the extent that we all end up uh, maybe uh, admiring a frog. I'm, I'm, using, I'm being very simplistic in this, but the whole point is is that is that what makes oratory such a beautiful category is that it is about the artistry of putting words and images and concepts together and delivering that effectively. The the question or the challenge for the student right now is if you were the person behind the curtain who wanted to redesign a label that would really advance Latinos throughout the world over the next 20 to 30 or 40 years, what word would you select? That's going to take some thought. That's not something you flippantly think about. 
Uh, I would say talk to parents. You know, there's one final comment before we move on to the others. The term raza cosmica comes to mind. Kids may not know that that's another term that was used as a unifying social term in the Latino community years ago. People of the sun. And think about that. I think of Jorge Larabra mm -hmm. when he said, we have earned the right to have our place in the sun. We are la raza cosmica. Now that's cause for celebration. That's cause for joy. That says we are the reflection of all cultures of this world. So we're much more inclusive. We're much more tolerant. We're much more artful. Our music, our art, our, our literature all reflects the many parts that we recognize we're made of. So in our families, we don't make distinctions between darker skins and lighter skins or people of money and people without money. And everyone is important to la raza cosmica. So it's very strange to us when we witness racism the way we do in our own country. It's something we're not accustomed to culturally. And we don't want to be like that. We reject any culture that's racist because we, by accepting that term or accepting a centric, race-centric connotation about who we are, we're basically violating our own cultural principles. There's a term that the students or a social label that they may already be wearing or that as they go back to school as 10th graders, which is that of being NHIers. Uh, to you, as founder and who created this now this label has emerged, what do you think that label is gonna gonna mean for them as they enter tenth grade at the end of the summer? Well, I'm very proud of that. When people use the word I'm an NHR, they're talking history. They're saying I have a I played a role at one time. I've, I'm I'm an active member. I understand the vision and philosophy of this organization. I accept it. I participate in it. I participate in it, and I advance it. I play an active role in advancing that thought. It's, it's, it's in our NHI family, once again, you well said it one day that when you came from Pennsylvania to a program in New Mexico called the LDZ, that race was never talked about. And we don't consciously don't talk about race. Race doesn't matter to us. Culture does. Right. And we make a big distinction between race and culture. So for someone to say to me, I'm an NHIR, they're saying, I'm an inclusive, intelligent, thoughtful human being. And I like that. Well, we look forward to hearing those thoughtful human beings ideas this coming summer at the great debates that begin in, in just under a month. We hope this podcast was helpful, especially to the oratory coaches and oratory participants and parents helping out their students who are competing in the event this coming summer. There'll be more podcasts to follow on each event and topic for this coming year. Uh, thank you out there for listening to the NHI Podcast Network. For more information on the National Hispanic Institute, please visit our website, www.nationalhispanicinstitute.org. Call us at 512-357-6137. Find us on Facebook at NHIHQ or on Twitter NHI underscore news and at Instagram and Snapchat NHI underscore news. Thank you to Union Pacific for their generous support as a sponsor of the NHI Podcast Network. Music by Andres Cotto.